You notice I yeah. took my dust jacket off. Did you put it in a protective folder? I d already done that. I love I love doing that. Get did a wonderful job of that book, didn't they? Physically. Physically, and you know I just love the end I papers. Do too. I've just written an essay. You know, the next issue of CNQ is an homage to uh, Metcalf, and I've written an essay where I have some fun talking about editors. Right. And um, <laughs> without him, there'd be no book, and uh, it wouldn't be half the book it is w without him. And uh, but the we had some funny times too. Well, I know a couple of years ago he told me that uh, he was excited about. It. I think it was very early on. He was just trying talking to you to to get yeah. this thing going, and yeah, well, he uh, so, forced me into it, and I yeah. never, I'd never ever thought I might write a book. Yeah. But when he said that, he said, uh, "If you do it, I'll edit it as you send it to me." And uh, I said, "John, nobody gives a shit about an antiquarian book star." And he but look, said, "Look at the room today." I know. That was well. He said, "Our job is to do the work." And put it out there, and if they don't appreciate it, which is what he's been doing all his life, you know. Yeah, I know. So I thought I can't refuse after that. So I said yes, and but geez, I had no idea what I was letting myself in for. Mm -hmm. It's been a wonderful experience. So. Well, it's a wonderful book, I, I must say. It contains all sorts of things. It contains advice. It contains uh, storytelling, advocacy, humor, controversy, a bit of aggression. A lot of great quotes and quips and uh, choice lines and, and heart. Hmm. That's what I thought. Can't we just stop here no, before no. the criticism starts? <laughs> <laughs> so what I'd like to do is to do justice to the book is to go slowly through it, if we could. Right. And I'll just sort of identify points that have intrigued me and get okay. your feedback if that's sure. that works sure. for you. Okay. You've built all your own bookshelves. Yep. Yep, the Ma Mason system. I invented it. And what is that? It's how to build a bookshelf in 20 minutes. First shelf I ever built took three days. And I did everything wrong. I constructed it as though it was going to hold a thousand pounds in each shelf. A bookshelf functions on its own. It's actually almost metaphysical. A bookshelf works with three nails in it. Two inch nails will work. And the weight of the book stabilizes everything. Attaching it to the next bookshelf stabilizes it. Attaching every fourth one to a wall with one screw, even in a brick wall, stabilizes it. But I had to learn all those things. It reminds me of a, a kind of a brick archway. Precisely. Precisely. Yeah. The weight on the upper part uh, secures the bottom. But you don't know that till, till you've done it. And uh, I wrote an essay for CNQ about that, uh, how to build a bookshelf, because Dan Wells was opening a bookstore, and uh, I had mentioned that, and he said, how is it? So I wrote him an essay, and I have no idea if he'll publish it or not. Mm -hmm. I'm about 10 essays ahead of his editing. Well, that's because uh, he's got all sorts of people who want to be in that magazine. I know, I know. <laughs> Which is a good thing. It's an exciting magazine, yeah. one of the most exciting in the country, but you know what? Metcalf got a column from John Fraser, who's a very influential journalist, saying that that magazine was the best literary magazine in the country. And about two months later, I said to John, tell me, John, how many new subscribers did you get from Fraser's article? And he said, none. Mm. So that tells you a lot about Canada and literary magazines too. Yeah, no, I'm gonna, I yeah. want to get into to that. I'm not sure if we'll get in this session, but certainly uh, one of the future sessions. The finest list of paperbacks in America, Signet Books, originally was published as Penguins. Collectors should go after the first hundred under the original imprint for their cover art, which you call stunning. Oh. Tell us about the stunning covers. Well, the most stunning covers, in my experience, are actually not on Signets. They're on uh, both Popular Library and Dells. I collect the first 300 Dells. That's where the stunning word came from. The cover art, you see, all those young people go to art school, and then they come out of art school, and they don't become famous artists overnight. They have to earn a living. They have family feet. So what do they do? They do commercial art. So they came along, a lot of those guys, just at the time paperbacks were starting, mm -hmm. and they needed lurid covers, and they gave them leeway. There's a whole history, and the history's just starting to be written, and uh, the names are just starting to be learned. 
So when I get interested in paperbacks, which it's a, is my personal greatest interest in book collecting, now I do it with more passion than any of my other book collecting, <coughs> are those early paperbacks. What uh, are some of the names? Are you able to bring them up? Oh, I don't, I don't remember them. Okay. Uh, uh, but there are se now several books, and there are lists where people are identifying who these illustrators were. And there are several famous. I collect a few people. See, some of those people went from doing dust jackets earlier to paperbacks and paperbacks. So I have one British illustrator who I've been trying to collect for many years. It took me 15 years to find out that it wasn't a man, it was a woman. <laughs> and now I just found a checklist of her work mm. and found out that I have only a small proportion of her dust jacket design. I just was taken, you see, this is what happens. But who is it? Her name is Bip Parries, P-A-R-E-S. Oh, yes, I know her. She's Hutter. Hutter and Stoughton, she did a lot of James Houghton's books. Geez, you know more than you let on. She did a lot of those. She did a lot of uh, Oppenheimer's books and all hotter in Stoughton. Yeah. And I just got this checklist. So I now am at a, in a position where someone who knew more than I did is providing me information. So now I know some books to look at. I had a whole quarter of a shelf of books that I thought might have been illustrated by her, but they weren't signed, so I didn't know. This also shows another aspect of the excitement in collecting because you teach yourself as you go along, and the more you learn, the better buys you make, the more sophisticated you become. So th this is another of the many justifications for collecting. Well, you say on page 141, collector, take the time to educate yourself. Yeah. And there's a lovely description of a connoisseur. It's knowledge is the essence of the pleasure yeah. to be derived from beautiful things. Yeah. I made that up too. That's not bad, is it? Did you make that up? Yeah. 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 That is lovely. Yeah. Do you know what I used to do in my catalogs years ago? This is an aside. I used to attribute quotes to people because I knew no one would listen to me if I said So I'd say, as Shaw said, and then I would throw in something I had invented. And I had a lot of fun with that too. Debbie refused to type them anymore. She, she said, you're a, a liar. But you see, if I say something, who's going to listen? But if Bernard Shaw says something or Oscar Wilde says something. Authors and novelists lie to tell, to tell the truth. Yeah. Yeah, well, I made that up too, though, but I yeah. attributed it to someone I don't think I named who, but I made that up too. Mm -hmm. They do. They tell lies to show us the truth. And can you think of a better description of what a novel is? Collectors covet books like normal people covet money. Yeah, the key there is normal, of course. I, I threw something in this morning on purpose. I don't know if you noticed it, but yeah. I threw in the bit about people think that we're all nuts because we collect first editions. And the number of times that I've had someone say, well, I'm not really interested in, in, uh, uh, in first editions. I'm interested in the content. What that means is that's a translation of cheapskate. I'm a cheapskate, almost always a university professor cheapskate. Uh, that's what they're really saying is that they don't understand. So they might have $10,000 worth of sound equipment in their house to play their music. They might have just come from a $250 meal, but they can't pay $50 for a first edition because they only care about the content. And, and uh, that was a, a swing at them. And, uh, I try always to throw in little things like that to educate people. And but maybe they, are, maybe they are just interested in the content. Maybe well, they don't I'm, care. I'm not just interested in the contents on lots of books. Uh, that's but. valid. What I would say is absolutely. The young are interested in content, so they buy paperback. What you do in, a, in collecting is... Uh, is uh, you buy a paperback to see if you like the book. If you like the book, then you want a nice hard cover for a permanent uh, library, yeah. and then if you get to be our age and have, have a bit of money, then you might want a first edition, or you might want a folio society edition, or you might want a Count Scott Press edition, depending on the, uh, the, the uh, depth of your passion and how much you can afford to pay. Yeah. But when the guy says, I only care about the content, that's just bullshit. That just means uh, I don't want to pay for a book, of course. Mm -hmm. I, I have academic friends who uh, have never bought a book from me. I have one, one of my oldest friends, been a professor for 40, 
five years. We've been friends for 45 years. She's bought maybe three books from me. Uh, they get all their books for free. Yeah. The trouble with getting books for free, and I've been studying publishers and academics for many years, when you get something for free, you hold it in contempt. You take it for granted. That's why psychiatrists always charge patients, uh, no matter how much the patient might think they're sympathetic. The psychiatrist makes them pay because if you don't pay for it, uh, you don't take it seriously. Uh, all this is stuff I've accumulated over many, many years. Uh, and um, so that's, uh, that was my way of insulting those people yet again. Uh, I only prodding care them, about the content. Them, yeah. I wrote an essay which maybe will get published or maybe not because it was my response to one guy where he said, yes, I only care about the content. I could smell the wine in his breath. He'd just come from the restaurant next door. I said, oh, I understand that completely. Uh, and I sympathize. When I go into a restaurant, I always tell them, bring me your cheapest plonk. <laughs> I don't care about the content. I just want to get drunk. And furthermore, could do you not have some leftovers from yesterday uh, in the kitchen that I could eat? Because I only want to fill my stomach. And then I said, and furthermore, I go to the Sally Ann to buy all my my clothes, you know, you get real bargains at the Sally Ammons. They're really fashionable, high. fashionable too. Fashionable too. I got wonderful Harris tweed jackets once for five. Yeah. But you see, this is all deliberate insults at the kind of people I also am referring at, the yeah. ones who, if they educated themselves, these guys take pride yeah. in uh, knowing uh, wine and music and having their $10,000 worth of sound equipment. They don't want to educate themselves. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> a paperback is all right, but what about a beautifully printed page? Mm -hmm. What about a leaf from the Gutenberg Bible, which will make you cry? It's so beautiful. Yeah. These people are throwing that aside. You know what's interesting, too, is they'll spend uh, tens of thousands of dollars on a work of art that does not translate into I know. the beautiful, beautifully printed book that's actually <clears throat> taken maybe ten times as long to produce. Mm -hmm. And furthermore, Al Alberto touched very well on that today when he talked about books as icons. That's another thing that I go on and on about because what a book collector does is he imposes his sensibilities on the book. So the book is not just the beautiful thing. It's not just the content. It's also your recollection of the first time you read it, the emotional effect it had on on you. When you study human history, you see that the recollection that most brings back memory is smell. You see that from Proust right on through everyone else. Yeah. The other thing with books is the first time you read it. So you pick up a copy of The Wind and the Willows and yeah. you remember being six years old and your mother or father reading it to you and you were so awed Mm. that you didn't want to go to bed when the chapter was over. That's what a book does. Yeah, it so, imprints itself on your mind. It, yes, yeah. it, it imprints itself in your memory in a mm. way that only religious icons do, in my opinion. All sellers, all booksellers, should be collectors. Yeah. Because that way they'll know their customers. Yeah. You know, the equivalent would be the priest who would purport to tell us about uh, love. How can he? But you know, it's pretty much equally divided. About half my colleagues would say that uh, to collect when you're a dealer is a conflict of interest because you might be keeping stuff that one of your collectors wants. My answer to that is bullshit. My oldest friend, Richard Landon, the oldest book friend, who ran the Fisher Library for many years, uh, said uh, someone said, well, don't you ever have a conflict between your own interests and universities? And he said, yes, I do. And my interests come first. Every time. Now, I don't think he ever said that to the president of the university, but in <laughs> essence, it was true. And he had a wonderful collection he of had a books, study. books on books. Right? He had a study. It's still, still around. still there. Yeah. It will be given to the university. He had lots of wonderful collections, and yeah. I've appraised them all because he's been giving them to the university for years. And the rule is, you see, that a, a scholar who gives or donates a collection is allowed to keep it if he's still working on it. So he signs it over to the university, and now that Richard's dead, his widow is sending stuff. Yeah. But the Books on Book collection is, uh, I would be willing to bet the best in North America, by a hundred times the best in Canada, and it will all go to U of T. In the end, he was spending 
real money, real yeah. money, because he made a lot of money, his wife made a lot of money, they had no kids, so they yeah. traveled, they ate and drank, and they bought books. And, uh, and it doesn't get better than that. It doesn't get better no. than that. No. I tried to do that, except uh, I don't earn the money or even close to what he earned. Well, I'm trying to do that with my literary tourist project, and but it's, it's not easy to get there, but mm -hmm. so you admire people who've been able to fine-tune their lives to enable them to do that. The only advice I can give is every book you buy makes the next one easier, no matter how much more expensive it is. And the second thing is, is I wish I had started earlier, although I spent 20 years uh, drunk a good part of the time, and I bought a lot of books drunk that I wouldn't have had the guts to buy sober. Do you know how every yes. asshole friend you have says, oh, you know, I drive better when I've had two drinks, and these are the people we scrape up off the road, you know, the, they're fools. Yeah. But for some reason or other, I found that when I drank, and it started when I started going to Los Angeles, and then you'd have a martini at lunch, and I found that a drink gave me enough courage to trust my judgment better. And since I wasn't driving a car, and since my mistakes were only going to hurt me, it worked. I once go to a lunch when I had no money at all, when my rent was about $300 a month for both the house and the store, and I bought a $5,000 book. 30 seconds later, was that with a check that, uh, no, that, that was that bounced, or was it no, a good check? No, no. You know, a bookseller is not able to bounce a check. You can't bounce a check because the book world is very small. Yeah. Uh, yeah. My the friend then, and right. it's still a close friend, was a a real drunk. Uh, he he stopped twenty years ago, but after he stopped, it took fifteen years, and it took a lot of work from all his friends to get him back integrated into the trade because. He had bounced checks and people. The book world is very yeah. small. And yeah, and, and reputation is everything. The reputation is everything, and yeah. you don't tamper with it. You don't do anything to uh, damage your reputation. You know, I get calls from all over the world. Yeah. Do you know so and so? And I say, what is it? He said, well, he owes me money and he hasn't paid. If I don't know them, my friend's in trouble. Yeah. If I do know them, I say, well, that's so-and-so. I had a customer who died a few months ago, a guy from Los Angeles called me. This guy made a lot of money in advertising. This guy it was the guy who invented the jingle. How do they get the cream inside that chocolate bar? Absolutely brilliant. He made a lot of money, but he would be a binge buyer. He would go on a bin and didn't pay his bills sometimes. So this guy called me. He said, I got... For several thousand dollars, and this guy hasn't paid me. I said, he's a good guy, you're, you're all right. So then I called my customer, and I said, listen, the book world's smaller than you think it is. What you do in Los Angeles... Reverberates. Reverberate. Well, he didn't come in my store for two years. He was mad at me because I phoned him up and told him he's in trouble. Well, he paid a spill, of course. And that's how it works. It's called the Old Boys Network, and every profession has one. Yeah. You suggest that it's easy for the neophyte to learn that condition's important. Yeah. But the most difficult thing to learn and to know is rarity and scarcity. Same thing. Yes, yeah. of course, because it only can be learned through years and years of experience. Because you will have only seen that book a certain number of times um, over that period? An example I like to use is a young guy, not so young now, but when he started about 30 years ago, opened a bookstore, and I would go in his store, and we scout each other's store. That's part of the game. That's the best part of the game. So on a shelf, he would have three Robert Graves titles, two of which... Who you love. Yeah, but um, it could be any writer. It could okay. be Graham Greene. Yeah. But there's three books on the shelf, and they're all $50. Two of them I've had 30 times each from the time they were $5 work and they were out the fifth. The third I've never seen. You just buy the third one. Yeah. You buy it because you know if you haven't seen it when you've seen 30 copies of the others over that many years, it's got to be rare. And you'll be right 100 times out of 100 times. Yeah. So that's what scarcity gives and only experience uh, can teach you that. Experience and good bibliographies. Well, no, good bibliography is a whole different cup well, of good, tea, good but you have to know what you're looking at, of course. You have to know many's the time over the years. I mentioned that in the book, too. My first trip to Calgary, I bought what I thought might be a first edition of Edgar Allan Poe, but I didn't know 
Now, a smart dealer like my Debbie, who's very conservative, would have said, well, I can't buy that because it can't be a first edition, it's too cheap, but it's also expensive enough if it's not. I, I've paid more than it's worth. But a young dealer, a good young dealer, learns to do that. You gotta trust your instinct. That mm. should be a first edition. And of course, whatever happens when you do a home and do your bibliography, you find out. Mm. And in those days, 80% of the time, I would be making a mistake. So I would buy books for $20 that weren't worth 10. Yeah. That's money down the drain. That's your profit from the other. But in later years, that would reverse itself to where 80 to 90% of the time you should be right. And that's when it pays off. But, but, a, but a, bibliography, a bibliography will give you the number of books that were printed in that edition, yeah, yeah. which tells you something, right? Uh, well, every bibliography tells you something, and, and there's points. That's what I thought you were referring to, no. points and everything. But, I'm talking uh, about, yes, uh, about the number of books that When you know there printed. was one, I had a guy come up to me, a younger dealer, you know. I'm like all old men now. They young shock me with their ignorance. The guy comes up to me and said, that's a very rare book. This is about 2005. The book was published in 1990. And he said, that's a really rare book, Dave. Do you know, there were only 10,000 copies printed. I said, Jesus Christ, man. 10,000 copies. Do you know that in the 19th century, they regularly did 500 copies of Thomas Hardy's Three Deckers, you can still find them. Yes. He thought 10,000 copies was very few. Yeah. Uh, that's an awful lot when there's 3,000 collectors of modern first in the entire North America. Yeah. And on top of that, they like to say, oh, well, they all went into libraries, you know, that's the latest. 50 years ago, oh, well, they were bombed in the Blitz. That's why this is rare. Of course, now we get the internet and we find out all sorts of books that we thought were rare weren't so rare. Yeah. So I have a book that never been seen in Toronto, and then you press a button in the net and there's 25 copies all over the world. What does that do to rarity? Other dealers are by far the best customers in yep. the book business. It's not true now, but it used to be. Because they used to travel used around, to travel, scout yeah. other this shops, right? The saddest thing for me in the book trade, I used to be in any given summer, I would have a hundred different dealers come through sometimes ostensibly in holidays, but really scouting. Now you get none. Why Why would I go to another bookstore? My friend John Barry, Barry Peterson, right across the road, I'm not going to visit him. When we came to Kingston yesterday in the old day, I would have said to Debbie, you go down and see John Walters. I'm going over to Barry Peterson to see if I can make my days or weeks pay. Why bother now? He checks everything on the internet, same as everyone else does. The trouble is, the ignorant people do too. When I'm checking prices on the net, which I do too, I discount usually about the first 20 because it's fools who don't know what they're doing or copycats of others. And yeah. One guy will have an expensive first edition and another guy will have a Book of the Month Club reprint at 20% less and you'd know the second person is an ignorant fool. In a way, I suppose the new hunting ground, although it's nowhere near as much fun, is the internet because there you can find I'm it's assuming. called cyber scouting and cyber I don't scouting. do it at all but I know guys who spend all day doing it and frankly I don't believe that's true I believe that's the true. time they spend wasting looking for all that stuff guy who works for me is a nut about the computer he's on eBay all the time yeah. sure they find the odd sleeper but first of all that's not scouting no. and secondly you'd do far better to go out to a flea market somewhere. Yeah. Last week I bought a book for 15 bucks in a flea market, which I sold within a week for $6,000. Well, you're not going to do that on the internet, and you're now not going to do that in any good bookstore. It used to be the greatest pleasure for a guy like me was going out to small towns, small towns out around Toronto, because out there you had guys who didn't see. Well, the last time I did that, it was in Kitchener, it was a big bookstore, and he had all these glass cases with all his first editions in it. So he would have all sorts of first editions in the 45 to $75 range, all of which I had bought as remainders at 350 to $5 25 years ago. In other words, all books that I had five or six copies of that were still common, but he was out in the sticks. He didn't know that. He didn't have first edition collectors coming in to see. He didn't know that these were the lesser works of guys who'd already been famous, like Gore Vidal and Norman Miller. He's going to die with those books, but the yeah. most ludicrous thing was he'd have $75 on a book that I'd have $50 on. He was never going to sell it, 
But what he didn't understand was that those books are available everywhere. A defective book is never a bargain. Sometimes. Except Almost sometimes. Never. That's, right. added That's what that you said. Yeah. Yeah. Now, why, so, did you, why did you add that? Because sometimes it is. Because of the rarity. Yeah, yeah because of rarity. And yeah. I, I got that from Stillman Drake, who was one of the great collectors. He was the science guy. And he told me once, he gave a talk once, which was the single most wonderful talk I ever heard. And when he gave the talk, I thought it was superficial and amusing, but more or less pointless. It was a group of book collectors who got together. He said he collected early science in the days. Science didn't start to get collected till the 50s, you see. For that, in fact, in the late 19th century, modern first editions were Browning and people like that, and they were sold as used books. They weren't collected even as literature. Literature, collecting first edition in the late 19th century was collecting John Milton and people like that in first edition. That was what collectors did. But then they started Modern First, but it was the 20s before they started to do bibliography. Mm -hmm. And then in the 50s, someone said, well, just a second, if a first edition of Dickens is worth 10 times what the second printing is worth, how come Darwin's Origin of Species isn't important? How come all these signs? So they started to look at that. There was an absolutely wonderful book by a man called Percy Muir, which is the greatest book on English book selling in the 20th century that I've read. Still uh, bears it. And he and a partner innovated a lot of those things. They invented the collecting of music. They decided if books are worth something in first edition, why wouldn't music be? So they went and made a trip on the continent, came back, cataloged all this stuff with their heart in their throat because they were asking five pounds for something that they'd picked up for two shilling, mm -hmm. and it sold like crazy. In other words, they introduced the idea, well, this is what happened with science. So when Stillman started, he said, you know, I would see a book, and it would be lacking a plate. And I thought, well, I can wait till I get a perfect copy of this. And he knew the rule, because he also collected Joyce and Conan Doyle. But I may never see that one again. Yeah. So he bought it. He thought a defective book, especially in science, where he was buying it for the content. Back then he was. That yeah, back, well, he was buying so. because he was a professor of the history yeah. of science. Yeah. He was the foremost scholar in the world on Galileo. He was studying science from Galileo and everything surrounding him. But he was in virgin territory where no one knew anything. And even the dealers didn't. They had to pick prices out of the air. How scarce is this? How important is that? Well, that's why it speaks to the importance of a, of a collector kind of going after new terrain. Absolutely. If absolutely. you are the first, then no one knows what the prices should be. And so, uh, absolutely. And this is the excitement of it. Yeah. And uh, we started off talking about paperbacks. What do you suppose I'm doing? I'm paying 10 20 30 $40 for paperback. Now, there are paperback price guys where they'll give you prices like that. No one pays those. Hardly anyone collects them, or there's little pockets of people. Who right. That's precisely what I'm doing. I gave an interview to a magazine called M4, which is published out in the West Coast. And in the interview, the guy said, are there new areas where one can buy cheap books that will improve? And I said, uh, yes, there are, but I'm not telling you what they are. But I'm just telling you <laughs> what they are, in my opinion. Yeah. But I'm doing it for myself, and I'm having the time of my life, yeah. and I'm buying paperback, and I'm now starting to get an idea of scarcity. Uh, try finding vintage paperbacks. 50s and earlier now. Especially in good condition because they, good, they tend yeah, to be they treated. Fell, they fell apart. That's right. They fell yeah. apart because yeah. the glue. And I don't care anymore because I'm already paying fair. I go out to this guy who has a bunch and I spend a thousand bucks and I have fun. My friends think I'm nuts. But this is what collecting is. The guy who sticks his neck out and says, that should be important. Yeah. See, one of the saddest things about book collecting to me is I've come to realize that many collectors follow the leader. They're usually extremely intelligent people because mm -hmm. they've spent their lives reading about But then they come to a guy like me who tells them the rules, and they slavishly follow the rules because they're insecure. Well, my advice has always been learn the rules and then break them to your preference, and uh, that's good advice. Just like uh, Pound and Elliot said about poetry. But Parallels are everywhere. Yeah? That's why I collect Canadian book design. 
no one seems to be going. I mean, I love it. Yeah. And it's it's not that expensive to go out. And it's find cheap it. as dirt, actually. And, uh, and uh, I knew two collectors uh, who both started collecting Canadian books illustrated by the Rufus Seven. Both their collections now are an institution. But when they were doing that, books were sold for three dollars as literature, and no one paid any attention to the design. That's, so that, that's right. You're cutting uh, it. You're cutting it a different way, aren't you? Most yeah. people would buy it for the author, but hey, like I buy Frank Newfeld's books, for yeah. example, or, or Robert Reed, or you know, you cut well, it a different way. Uh, you may not be alone, but I bet you there aren't half a dozen people in the country doing that. Guys like Nicky Drombolis can talk for months about that, but he's not collecting. He just happens to have them. Go off on your own path. Frank Newfeld, we know his reputation. Robert Reed, now that uh, they, uh, he, they're giving awards in his name. But this will all come to pass. There's always been guys around, you see. Uh, I know a guy who built the greatest collection, in, certainly in Canada, of the uh, famous American Bruce Rogers. Yeah. And he gave it all to the University of Toronto. But because he by then was a addicted collector, he started on Will Reuter and the Ali Kondo Press. Mm. But he has almost everything now. And of course, he's a friend of Will's, and he yeah. gets it from then he gets ephemera given to him. But you mentioned Ali Kondo Press to most Canadians. They won't even know what you're talking no, about. And when you mentioned to Will Reuter, Gee, I'd love to buy some of your early books. He doesn't have them. No, he doesn't. He, he doesn't have them himself, and he doesn't care. He charged for them his time and what it cost him yeah. to print them, but he didn't take into consideration himself that he's a brilliant, brilliant designer. Yeah. So to go off on your own path, there's a, somebody did an essay, a book of essays, about 30 years ago called New Paths in Book Collecting, and then they did a second volume, and it's all new ideas, and you could read that with profit, even though you're not interested in collecting any of the areas the woman had essays on. What that teaches you is, gee, new areas, if you're the first one there. Yeah. I, had a, I had a collector who used to lecture me all the time, telling me things to collect. And I realized sometime later, I always listened to her, she was a great collector, that... Uh, she was right, except it meant long-term collecting. And at a certain age, you're too old for long-term collecting. I'm too old for long-term collecting in paperbacks, which I've been going on about. However, when I drop Deb, Debbie's going to get them all, and she'll also have heard all my lectures. So the, there's a lot of books you could buy now that if you just put them away somewhere for 30 or 40 years, you'd be astonished what will happen to them in value. But if you don't have 30 or 40 years left, then you've got a different problem. Well, hopefully you've got a partner or a, or a child who actually loves books the mm -hmm. way you do. Here's my, uh, one of my favorite passages in the book. And the book is, I'll, I'll be introducing the book, of course, but I'm, and the book is entitled The Pope's Bookbinder, a memoir by David Mason, who I'm happily speaking with right now. While a good part of the excitement in finding a significant book is the eventual profit, the imaginative scout comes to realize that he has a higher purpose. He is rescuing from obscurity something which has historical or aesthetic value to society. And having rescued it, his next social function is to then place it somewhere where its contribution to the record of civilization will be understood. He is serving the future by saving the past, a noble activity. And this is where I think we can get a bit upset about libraries. Libraries should be encouraging this buying and facilitating exhibitions and celebrating collectors, and they're not. It's a disgrace. It is a disgrace. The great ones are, though. And I was lucky enough to be allied with University of Toronto from an early age. And one of the curious things which someone will write about someday to my mind, and I will to a degree, but some more, someone more objective. Richard Landon started at the University of Toronto within a week of me starting in the book trade, and we became friends instantly, and our careers paralleled each other. And he made the same advances. I went from a lowly used bookseller Oh, here they are back. I don't think we're even close to done, or yes, are we? Sir. He doesn't. He, he explained to me that he doesn't 
like being watched, and I understand that. That's okay. I, we've sat How in, much more? I sat in the sun and drank. Uh, no, I like being good. watched. I like being watched. Yeah. But well, by pretty women. Well, by not pretty not women. Your and that's why it was so hard for me to send you out of the room. But truth be known, I really don't. How much? I don't like to watch. <laughs> <laughs> How much we more like time do you think? Well, I was I was saying like uh, I think like I think we should uh, I can come to Toronto. I mean, uh, you can we can do stuff on the phone. No, I don't like the phone. I'm actually he enjoying this, Nigel. You don't You've do got a very astute take on all that, but we've already got ten times as much as is any good for any blog. Are you not thinking of doing a book? Are you? Uh, no, I'm just Very kidding. Smart. Uh, no, we can do, do as much uh, more as you want. What do you know about a blog? You've never seen one. No, this isn't a blog. This is uh, this podcast. is this is a podcast. Yeah, yeah. or oh, a broadcast. A, bro- a no, podcast. podcast. I, yeah. you, know, you know Melvin Bragg. You know I, I didn't know Melvin that. Bragg. Well, uh, is that what you do as a freelance then? I do that. I yeah, I do Melvin a variety Bragg. of things. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, we can do as much more as you want. Great, but. Um, Great. You're not comfortable with them here. I'm very comfortable with them here. Do you? You don't you mind now? No, actually, Shall we you, just? No, keep, you, no, I think you, they want you to get out of no, here. You can't no, you can't. No, you don't want to just keep going. There? I'd love David? to keep going, but it's, uh, no, it's again. No, you can't Pardon? do this now. You have to do it some other time. I've I think seen. they have a schedule, and you can't now. 